In this episode of STEM Bin, we're going to spring into some mechanical engineering. After this video, you're going to be hooked to the channel. So in this episode, we're talking about springs, and in particular, linear mechanical springs. Linear springs can come in all sizes and variations, from the small and medium to the large and chunk-like. Before I dive into a bunch of theory, I'd like to point out some of the applications they're useful for, such as this AA battery compartment, where these tapered linear springs help to compress the batteries and keep them in the compartment. Or in the case of the humble retractable pin, where the retracting that takes place is all thanks to the linear spring inside. Or if you have a car with a piston engine in it, then chances are you can find linear springs there too. So first I'll go over some basic concepts, starting with what the definition of linear spring means. It essentially just means that a spring is acting in the same direction that the force is applied, whether it's compression or tension. A compression spring, as you might imagine, requires a compressive load or force, and then a tension spring requires a tension or pulling force. And another type of spring that is commonly used is what's called a torsion spring, where it takes angular or rotational deflection and converts it into torque, such as these closed pins or my 3D printed tweezers, but that's for another video. For the electrical engineering viewers out there, spring symbols commonly look like an inductor or a resistor, not that there's much similarities outside of that. So then we arrive at the governing principle for your standard mechanical spring, and that's called Hooke's Law. A quick thing to mention is that there's actually a lot more applications to Hooke's Law than just looking at simple springs. In fact, it's used commonly in material science to describe the elasticity and strain relationships for materials and all kinds of other applications, but that's beyond the scope of this video. That being said, it aptly describes the situation here where I have a compression spring lined up next to a ruler and it requires a force, or energy for that matter, to compress it or deflect it. And as it gets smaller or as I compress it more, it requires more force to be exerted. And the equation that describes the spring force is simply the product of the spring constant or spring rate times the displacement or distance of deflection of your spring. And in this example, I have a spring that is fixed on one end and then has a force that is applied to the other, where you can see the deflection happening. Throwing some numbers at the equation, we have an example where we have a spring with a spring constant of 10 pounds per inch, and it's deflected one inch. Plugging in those values and canceling units, then we can see that at one inch of deflection, we have 10 pounds of force. And for the metric viewers out there, I have a spring that's spring constant 10 newtons per centimeter, deflected 1 centimeter, results in 10 newtons of force. So building off of this example, let's say we don't know the spring constant and we want to find it. One way we can do that is by measuring both force and displacement values and then tabulating them. Once we have all the data points, then we can plot them and draw a best fit line. The slope of that line is simply the spring constant. So in a way we work backwards. Then it's simply a matter of calculating the slope, and then there's your spring constant. So now instead of just talking about the theory, I'm actually going to demonstrate this. And that's where these springs come into play. They are 2-inch springs with a model designation 1NCG2. And I picked them up from Granger for about $5, and it came with 5 springs. The thing that makes them special in this case is they come with a known spring rate of 20 pounds per inch. And the plan here is to build a jig so that I can calibrate it and then actually be able to determine the spring rate of any spring that I put on the jig. So here we have the initial setup of the jig or basically a force sensing apparatus that I'm going to be using for this project and many other projects. In this case, we have a 20 kilogram load sensor set up between two blocks. And basically we're gonna have a spring and a, met a ruler or a measuring device to uh, get force readings off of. 
And a quick briefing on the electronic side of things, the load sensor sends a signal to the HX711 load cell amplifier, which then sends that to Arduino board, and that'll display on an LCD screen. And this is some design of the 3D printed parts I made for the jig, and I wanted to show a lot more detailed build of this, but I figured that it would make this video way longer than it needed to be, so I think I'm actually going to save that for a future one. But until then, just enjoy the build compilation. So as you can see, I continue to load the spring by 8th inch increments while collecting the data after every point. And even though the values are about a 7th to a 9th of a pound off, it still wasn't terrible. So it's something I can work with. And I set it to make the cutoff point for data collection at an inch of deflection. Once I had all the data collected, I then threw it into Excel and then plotted the theoretical versus experimental for both the standard and metric values. And then you can see on the plots for the experimental values for the standard side, we have about 19.4 pounds per inch. And then on the metric side, we have about 3.4 newtons per millimeter. Then again, if you're feeling fancy, you can use MATLAB software to do the same thing that Excel did in this case, except that it looks cooler 
and it's fun to feel like you're a professional coder, even though all you did was just plot something. And then here again, we have the same data with a 19.381 pounds per inch spring rate. So again, we have the theoretical and experimental spring rates for both the standard and metric systems, except for the metric, the only thing I changed was converting it to newtons per centimeter because it seemed a little more intuitive. And then something good to do with these values is to calculate the percent error, not only to determine the approximate accuracy of the loading apparatus, but also to know what kind of percent tolerance I should be aware of say if I want to calculate the spring rate of any unknown spring. And then plugging in all the spring rate values into the percent error equation, we get 3.1% error for the standard and 3.143% for the metric, which is basically equal to each other. I could speculate a lot of possible sources of where the error could be coming from. I won't go into that in this video, especially since, I'm, like I said before, I'm going to have a video on the load applicator. Um, that being said, some obvious ones I noticed, especially at the high loading values, is there's a lot of deflection and flexing with the, with the apparatus itself. Particularly in this case, you can see where I think I tolerance the 3D printed parts a little too large. So you can see the front post being bent back a little bit at around 19 pounds of force. So there's definitely some improvements to be made on this system. So I have here a small one and a quarter inch spring that I want to test as an example. After slightly modifying the loading apparatus and collecting five data points at eighth inch increments like I did before, I end up plotting the data points and then one best fit line later I have a spring rate of about 11 pounds per inch. The plus or minus values are a tolerance or uncertainty and they're calculated from that percent error found earlier. Quickly mentioning something I didn't talk about earlier in the spring world is something called the progressive spring, where the spring rate is variable. And in some cases, it'll be due to the active versus inactive coils or how it's wound. There's actually a lot more to it, and they're commonly used on suspension applications. It's also worth mentioning a cool video on springs from this old Tony's channel, where he shows how to manufacture springs and some other fundamentals about them. And while we like to think of rubber bands and other elastomeric materials as spring-like, they actually don't behave like springs from a hookian perspective, as Destin from Smarter Every Day covers in this video. And I'll leave both videos I just mentioned in the description below if you want to check them out. And even though there is a lot of material to cover, especially in the last couple minutes here, I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you did, feel free to like, share, subscribe, and stay tuned for the next one.